ChatGPT and other AI tools have captured the imagination of users as a way to create lots of new content, but like many cool technologies, they can also be used to commit crimes. On today's episode of Today in Tech, we're going to show some of the ways ChatGPT can, ChatGPT can help hackers and other bad actors, but also how security pros can use the tool to help defend networks and data. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me in studio today is Itai Maor, an adjunct professor of cybersecurity at Boston College and an industry-recognized cybersecurity researcher. Welcome, Itai. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And so um, give, me a, give me a little bit of background. How did you first recognize that ChatGPT could be used as a cybersecurity tool for both good purposes and bad purposes? Was it right when it came out or were you kind of following it, uh, you know, along the way? So I actually have been following it for a while. Um, you know, even in my classes f about four years ago, we were talking about how GPT-2 has different applications that can be used for all kinds of things, including open source intelligence and pointing it uh, onto certain people or certain organizations and letting it do the work, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think the major difference and the problem, so to speak, was is you needed to know a little bit of coding, you didn't know how to use it. And when they came out with ChatGPT, when OpenAI came out with ChatGPT, they made it so approachable and so usable for anybody that, right. you know. Right, so you were right on board when 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 version 3 came out and, and then you could see how easy it was to sort of make these prompts. And um, it wasn't necessarily, it was, you know, was it used for uh, mainly as a coding tool in the beginning or did was it always sort of like coding was just one of the applications that you saw that it could be used for? Uh, when ChatGPT came out yeah. initially, well, yeah. it started just everybody jumped on board, you know. Yeah. Uh, once it became something that anybody could access and use, you had so many different applications for it. Because initially when, when, when people were talking about GPT, they were talking about it as, hey, it's something that, you know, can replace human in writing. So a lot of the tests that we, we saw um, were with writing, you know, write me an essay or summarize this topic. Yeah. But as you start to explore it, you realize, wait, there's a lot more that I can do with it than just write my essay for my university. Right, and that's where the, the code stu the code stuff started coming in. Um, but but just to take another step back, is AI a concept? Uh, is that a new concept within the cybersecurity realm, or is this just because it's generative AI? It's a little bit different. But you've been working with sort of automation or auto, you know, AI type stuff before, right? Yeah, actually, if if I go back as far as um, wow, I'm dating myself now. <laughs> uh, about 22, 23 years to my first job in year two thousand mm -hmm. was at a security company that uh, it wasn't called uh, AI. Um, it was called neural networks at the time, right? right and they were using right. these different capabilities in order to uh, perform security tasks. And we've seen it kind of evolve over the time. Uh, we've seen it move to uh, machine learning and AI and deep learning and all these uh, uh, different elements of artificial intelligence. And now we have it in a form that, you know, again, is, is accessible and usable to, to everybody. But in the cybersecurity world, it has been around for a while. I even recall, um, monit um, actually, I was running uh, at RSA Conference Asia about five years ago, mm -hmm. a panel, and uh, one of the panelists uh, showed us an AI, uh, an offensive AI tool that he created as a proof of concept at the time. But these things have been around. Yeah. Now, when you use the word offensive, you not mean like I'm offended by that, but mm -hmm. more of like offense, defense, right? Exactly. Yeah. How to use it to perform more of the nefarious actions. Right, right. Okay. And so um, how do you utilize chat GPT in your own classes at BC? Is it, do you, are you embracing it? Do you use it to tell students how to do things, that kind of stuff? Because um, I know we've had, we've, we've had some other people on the show here that are concerned about using it for cheating type of a thing and things like that. But those are different fields in this, when you're teaching your classes, um, how do you, you utilize ChatGPT? So first of all, it's, pre it's pretty new, so we're just yeah. starting to use it. But um, I have to tell you, I kind of take the uh, not traditional approach to teaching in general. Yeah. Uh, and especially here. Uh, you know, I recall um, 20 years ago, roughly, when uh, the, the internet became really big and accessible. Again, once it's accessible, then everybody starts to use it. Yeah. That uh, schools and universities said, you're not allowed to use the internet. You know, Wikipedia is not a quotable uh, source, stuff like that. And I'm like, really? Are you you're the one who's going to stop progress? You're, you're going to one who's gonna, you're going to stop it? I don't I'm, I don't buy into that. I right. actually think that um, this this is a type of technology that's going to be around for a while. We need to be early adapters. And so, actually, on the second class of of this semester's course, I introduced ChatGPT to the students, and I told them not only are you not not allowed. 
I actually want you to use it. Mm -hmm. Use it for each and every homework. I want you to get used to this whole concept and you're going to hear a lot about it, prompt engineering. How to work with AI and, and generate the result that you want from it. Like you said, it's a generative AI. It's, right. a, it's not just used for analysis. Right. So, I actually asked my students to use it. And in the last homework that they submitted, I already saw some of them adding the comment that I've asked. I wrote this with the help of chat GPT. Right. Like, Great. So it's like, yeah, I guess as long as you're sort of upfront about what you did and, you know, and acknowledging that you used it to help it as a framework, I think everybody is, is, is okay with that at the moment. Right. Yeah. I, I, I hope that people will, will adapt to it and, and use it and not just be afraid of it and try to, you know, postpone the inevitable, so to speak. All right. So you, you, you gave us some examples of, of how you're using ChatGPT or, or some of the examples of how others might be using ChatGPT. We're going to start with the bad because, you know, the bad news is always more interesting or the bad ways that are more interesting. So our first slide here is, um, you know, that you have a penetration. You've asked it. The, the prompt was, I have a penetration testing task. There is a website with an input field. What can I do to test it for vulnerabilities? Do you want to bring that up, Chris? Yeah. Okay, so can you... No, that's, uh, go back to the, the first one, I which was... I think we actually removed that one. Oh, we did remove this one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yep. All right, never mind. All right, write mm -hmm. it. Go back to the Mimi Cats one, Chris. <laughs> all right, so write a, Java, uh, write a Java code that downloads Mimi Cats and runs it using PowerShell. So can you explain sort of what, what, what results you were getting and, and just talk about that? Yeah, I actually started, as you mentioned, I started with some very basic stuff, like show me how I can hack a website. And, and the results that I got with, were very, what I would call... Googleable, right? There were things that um, you can find on Google. So I wanted more of the generative stuff rather than information. So I asked it to write a script that downloads Mimikatz. Mimikatz is a tool that you can use on networks to scrape passwords. Okay. And um, so download uh, uh, Mimikatz and I run it using PowerShell, which is uh, what's called living off the land attack. So using stuff that's already on everybody's computer. PowerShell is something that everybody has. It's an uh, administrative scripting tool. Well, you can use it for whatever you want. Yeah. The cool thing about it, it wrote the script immediately. Like okay. Split second and there it is. Right. Now, I think what this does is really highlight for us and show how ChatGPT is lowering the bar for attackers. Um, because, you know, again, going back 20 years ago, you needed to know somebody who knows somebody in order to get into this whole field of cyber crime or, or offensive security, so to speak. Um, then you had people open up on the criminal underground, all kinds of shops and services, you know, fraud and ransomware as a service uh, and all these things. Now the bar is even lower. You can go in without even knowing almost anything and just ask the AI to generate it for you. Right. Was, what, wasn't like back in the early days, that's what we called script kitties and, and things like that, where you could go on and find all of these scripts. So you didn't have to know necessarily how to write the code, but you could just sort of run these scripts, right? So, so the script critics are yeah. the ones that are, you know, it's it's like a term used for those who don't know how to code and don't know how to do their own for, attacks. They just say, right. take scripts and run them. Right. Uh, but now you have this thing that can actually generate the, the, the code for you, which yeah. is really interesting. And by the way, when I say lower the bar, and we'll talk about this later, it lowers the bar for the attackers. It also lowers about the bar for the defenders right. in a good way. And I'm yep. saying this is a positive. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, we'll get to yeah. that. Don't don't worry. We'll, so on on this one where it says write the Java code, that if you typed that into Google, would you you wouldn't get the code. You would just get mm -hmm. sort of like here are some sites where you can download Mimi Cats. Here are some you know or things like that. Is that what is that the big difference between? Google and this sort of the chat GPT stuff? Yeah, it's information versus a product, so yeah. to speak. And I, I have to highlight, I'm not using chat GPT on this example. This example is I'm using the uh, playground, oh. which is the less restrictive uh, side. It's like the API side of open AI because chat GPT will, if you try something like this, first of all, chat GPT will tell you, you're trying to do something, you're being naughty. Okay, so, not, so it does know that you're trying to do something because that was a good question I was thinking of, of you know, is there any sort of filters that they have that, that can detect that you're doing something that's not cool? They do. Yeah. And there are already a lot of articles and researches that show how you can bypass them and they try to, they have all kinds of iterations and now they're, they're better at it. But, um, Chad GPT will also tell you that I'm only trained on a certain amount of information where in the playground is not restrictive. You okay. can choose the model that you want to give you the answer and it is connected to the internet. So you can actually point it. And the internet, something you can do with Chad GPT and do all kinds of fun stuff, which I actually yeah. will show later. Okay. So when you, when you, now when this gen code was generated and again, split seconds, like five seconds or mm -hmm. less, right? Did you check the, the, did you check the code because you do know how to code? Mm -hmm. Like, is this, is this a hundred percent accurate? Is no. this, oh, it's not. It's, okay. It's the, the code that was generated for me in this example. And maybe some examples we'll see in a couple of slides. Um, we're not a hundred percent. But they were not far. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so if you knew how to write the code, 
you could then go in and go, okay, this isn't this isn't really what I want to do, but you could make the tweaks. But you've now sped up the process. Extremely sped up the process, yeah. and and these are relatively complex things, right? There's much easier tasks that you can ask it to do, and it will perform it perfectly. And also keep in mind, maybe there will be iterations of this of the of the AI itself that will write better code. So. All Everything right. is on the table. Let's go to the next slide, Chris. This is the phishing email. And this is what we've heard about before, too, is that most of the time as a human, when I, when I receive an email, whether it's someone, you know, some royalty member from Nigeria <laughs> or, you know, those things, you can always tell because the English is broken mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily sound like it's a real person. But now, since you're using a generative AI sort of tool, it, it can make it sound really good. So this is an example you have. Um, I think the first one we did was write a phishing email that looks like it's coming from the from Logan Roy, the CEO of Waystar Royco, asking the recipient to click on a link that will look like a company survey, but will actually be to this website. And you mm -hmm. just made up a fake website name. And then, interestingly enough, you did one version in English, one in Japanese, and one that in the style of Robert <laughs> Frost, because I can think you're trying to get them to show the creativity here, right? Yeah. So a couple of things about this. First of all, if you'll see it, my request, I actually have a spelling mistake, which... Yes, th the I didn't thing. say the spelling mistake, but yes, there were some spelling mistakes in the prompt. Yep, exactly. Yeah. But the AI knows how to correct the stupid human. So <laughs> we did that. Um, and and yeah, I asked it for... Actually, this is the example where I only asked three versions. Uh, for the nerds that are listening, um, which I'm a... I am myself. I asked it to also write one in Klingon and one in Tolkien Elvish, which it did. Um, so, <laughs> but if I got an email at Tolkien Elvish, I would be like, I don't know about this. Saruman has a lot of money that he wants to give you. Yeah. You just need to. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I asked for three versions and a couple of things about this that which are interesting. Um, so in Engl a version Engl in English, perfect English, no grammar mistakes, no spelling mistakes like mine. Yeah. Um, what's also interesting, you can say, okay, give me a hundred versions of this, different ones, because you know uh, when you're trying to detect phishing emails. You can say, well, if you see this sentence in emails, you know that that is something bad. Right. It'll generate new versions. Yep. Not a problem. Then a version in Japanese. Okay, so right there, and then you're you're actually cutting off um, all these localization services that criminals offer in the underground where they say, oh, you want me to do phishing for you in Japan? No problem. I'll translate and make a perfect... No need for that. You can do that right now immediately. Um, and then there's the uh, Robert Frost version, which yeah. actually I was a little bit um, disappointed when I started reading it because all it did was the first kind of quote Robert Frost's poem. Right. Uh, so I was like, right, this is not his style. So what is this? And then, but it got to the last sentence. I remember it says, uh, thank you for taking the road less traveled. Yes. And I was yeah. Like, the answer on there was thank you for your help and for taking the road less traveled. And I was like, oh, it understands. <laughs> it knows. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, Again, this is a big, this is a big deal in terms of, cause that was my first line of defense in detecting as a human whether this was real or not. Um, now obviously if, I don't know who Logan Roy is, so I'm gonna be like, eh, but if it was from my actual boss or, you know, or, or Chris over there, or, you know, then, and again, that, that takes into the whole social engineering aspect of, 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 cybercrime and things like that. So um, if, if a criminal knows specific people that they can target because they know of their social connections, they can use this to, to really try to get them to click that link. And that's the, that's the goal, right? Is to have them click that link that goes to that, that, yeah, that crazy exactly. Website. So Logan Roy is just because I'm watching Succession now, so okay. I, took, I took that character. But yeah, but think <laughs> about it in the context of uh, BEC, of business email compromise attacks, where somebody compromises a CEO or CFO's email account. You can then ask the AI, write an email in the style of, and point them to, you know, learn learn this data set right. and write in this style. Um, and that is a little bit more concerning. If we want to take it a step further, well, what happens when you incorporate deep fakes and voice synthesis and you can create videos in the style and, and not just, it looks like the real person is speaking to you. Yeah, we, we did a show on that with the, the, the early voice uh, AI analysis and some of the deep fakes. And that's, that's, that's accelerating at the same pace that this stuff is generating. So this so is now the you back end. Yeah, you combine that with that. And, you know, like I said, I get a voicemail and it sounds like the voicemail. The English is correct. You know, it, it's got its cadence. Of course, I'll probably just be like, yeah, I guess I should Venmo him. But, and I'm not thinking about the second factor of authentication. Like, let me call him back and see if he actually sent this. So, mm -hmm. like, for example, I got, here's an example of something that happened in my real life. I got, uh, my wife sent me a, a text message that said that she got uh, a, a text message from our oil company. 
And so we're on a monthly budget plan when we pay her. And, she, and it was like, hey, your credit card was denied. Can you call this number? <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to, cl- A, I'm not going to call the number they gave me. So I went to the website and called their main number and then said, hey, I got this. Is this from you, you guys? And they, they confirmed it. But, you know, I took that extra step of sort of validating and not just kind of falling for the, and it wasn't a phishing attempt. I think it was really them. Um, but, but most people won't. Most do, people won't do that. Won't. Yeah. Once it re- you see it and it looks real, and especially if you in- incorporate social engineering elements of sense of urgency, like we'll lock your account within twelve hours if you don't. People are just like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's jump into the third one here. This is a this is the third sort of bad exam or bad guy example, <laughs> uh, and this is write a Python script that searches for doc and PDF files that contain the word confidential, copies them to a random folder, and once the folder gets to a size of 100 megabits megabytes right. zips them and then transfers them to using ftp i mean you got pretty specific things here this is this an example of how specific you can get or is this an example of just again writing code so f- so, so first, oh, first of all I yeah, just, we, we got to finish oh. this too uh, and then write explanations for each function in the form of a rhyming poem <laughs> Because why not? Um, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm cheating a little bit here. Okay. Because what you're seeing is the final product, but I actually had to do this several ti- several iterations until I got the result that I wanted. Right. Which shows you that, again, going back to what we started with, let's get used to this tool and understand how to work with it in order to re- get the results that we want. Right. Um, but yeah, I basically designed here uh, a ransomware attack, right? And I asked it to write the code, which it did, and, it, and actually you're only seeing parts of it, but it was... Pretty long. Yeah, because I don't want anybody to like screenshot this and then all of a sudden say like this is the this is what we need to do. Yeah, don't do this. Uh, it's not. Yes, don't do this at home. But uh, and then I asked, you know, because it's so creative, why not have us have it explain uh, to uh, me, the mere human here, what is it doing in 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 rhymes, which it did pretty nicely. I'll tell you. Which also, one is your favorite poem here? The, the one two. on the right hand side. Okay, is, so this is the poem that it came up with while it was also doing doing for, generating the for code for a specific function. Yeah. Right. So this function will zip the files tight, encrypt them with AE two five six. That's just right. Then transfer the data with FTP site to the IP one two three four day or night. Like that's pretty impressive. It is good, and yeah. you can ask it. I want it in the style of Metallica or the <laughs> Beatles, and it'll do that. It's, it's really funny. And this is all on the playground, right? This is not in the publicly available. Or Actually, that this one, one that was one? in ChatGPT. Okay. It, uh, so again, sometimes you have to also social engineer the AI because again, it'll, it'll understand you're trying to do something bad. Yeah. So you have to say, oh, I have a, I have a testing. To, you know, uh, uh, thing that I need to do, or or I was allowed to perform this task by my superior yeah. stuff like that. So again, was the code here that was in you know the, was the code example in this one accurate as well? I would well, say or? very good, not perfect. okay. Does that mean that that a tool like this could actually teach someone how to write code or type? You know, give them the examples, or do you still see this human teaching? student learning type of scenario um ultimately it might be able to perform complete courses so i still i hope i still have a job at bc (laughs) um but actually when we get to some of the good stuff that it does yeah it can help and it will aid you and and now we're getting to lowering the bar for the good guys in a good sense all right and so those are the great examples of of sort of how it's being used in in the bad sense but let's switch gears and now we're gonna we're we're gonna say we want to stop all of these things or we want to stop some of these attacks or most of these attacks so uh, there's an example of of defending made easier <laughs> through ChatGPT. So our first example of, of this one is the snort rule, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you you put in a prompt here. What is the purpose of this snort rule? And then you had uh, a, a bunch of code log mm-hmm. TCP 192s da 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 da, and then message mounted access. Yeah. So okay. But, so but, yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm a new guy in cybersecurity. I just started my job. I'm looking at, you know, snort rules. I don't understand them. Help me out here. Um, and yeah, you can, you, sorry. I, I would hope that if you were hired as a new guy that you, and like, I don't know what snort is, but I'm hoping that, but I'm not a cybersecurity guy. I'm hoping that you, they are they would know this, right? Yes and no. There's okay. a, lot, a lot of different domains. Maybe somebody's trying to get into this. Okay. I'm not making any assumptions. Yep. Just explain this to me. So as okay. opposed to, you know, a Google result, which you'll start, okay, what does this parameter mean? What this one means? It actually explains what the rule does and explains all the different parameters, yep. which is which is really nice. It's it's very useful, very easy. You know, I, I showed this to my niece and she said, you know, it helped me figure out something that I've been working on three and a half hours now. It just, it explained it to me. Instead of me saying, searching for an answers and then trying to build and construct right. what I was looking for. And this has applications beyond obviously cybersecurity too. I mean, Everything. like, yeah, like teach me uh, concepts that I might not 
I might spend a lot more time doing on traditional mm -hmm. sort of Google. Uh, was there anything in here that, that was interesting from the results that came out? No, I, I, I was just that it was organized well. Organized and how quickly it clear yeah. quick and I will say if you're doing something super customized it might have not given me such a good result so this was a very easy rule to okay. understand um, but there are other things that actually made me drop my jaw I think we'll are we getting to that one as the next one the the miter attack uh, that was or is that, that that was the second one that was one that was I was pleasantly surprised and then we'll get one to our where I was shocked. okay so we're gonna do the the miter attack one Chris. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is now the the prompt is based on the following PDF file list all of the miter attack IDs used by the attackers. Ah, uh, no, no, we oh, skipped no. that one. We're oh no, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that one. All right, that's an early version of what we'll there see. There we now. go. I'm sorry. Uh, I am investigating an attack and saw the attackers use different techniques. Um, they perf they first performed T1078 and then T1047. Analyze recent attacks where these two techniques were used and tell me what will likely be the next miter attack technique they use. Quote me at least 10 previous attacks where the attacks use these two techniques, detail what their next move was, mention the name of the attacking group or team if known, and the name of the target. And again, pretty specific prompt. Yes. Yes. And this is what you're looking at here is like, say you're, you're under an attack, your company, you're under an attack, or you're investigating an attack that happened. Um, this almost allows you to predict the attacker's next move based, of course, on previous events. Okay. But the results that you see here, that's like at least a day's worth of an of analysis, research, right? Exactly. Yeah. Of sitting. And yeah. this, this was 10 seconds I waited for this. And it's really... So this wasn't on a Wikipedia page somewhere. No, no. Yeah. But, but I mean, all the information is out there. Yeah. It just collected all of it. It said, here are 10 attacks where the attackers use these two techniques. Here's, you know, valid accounts. And I think I don't, WMI, I think, was the, uh, uh, was the other one. And then I asked, what is the next one? And it said, I think it was 1059 or something, or 1057. All right, right. So then right at the end, bring the screen uh, back up, Chris. It says, um, based on the previous attacks, can you see that on, on the screen there? Yeah. It's right on the Based bottom. on the, these previous attacks, it is likely that the attackers will use T1059 command and scripting interpreter as their next move. So then... Now, as a def as a defender on this, you're like, okay, I think now we're, you're preparing for that type of an attack, right? Yeah, but just think about an analyst now sitting not in front of the ten these ones that he yeah. found, sitting in front of a hundred previous attacks, trying to analyze, extract what are the minor numbers that are associated with it, and then coming up with which ones are relevant, and then extracting what is the next most likely move. I mean, that's a lot of work that you just you know, and it goes back to. AI will not replace us, at least not now, but it'll definitely enhance you. If you know how to use it, if yeah. you take it as another tool, it'll give you so much more. Okay, so now we're going to get into um, uh, some coding examples. <laughs> and the first one we've got here is um, that your prompt was, hey, here's the following code that I have. And you're asking it to find the bug. What is the bug in the following code? And, you, and then you've got it. And then yeah. uh, did it find it? So here's <laughs> where my, my jaw was on the floor. Because the code that you <laughs> okay. see here is yep. a code that would run. Right. Okay. It's it's a code that I found somewhere on the internet that looks for um, uh, um the smallest value in an array of values. Okay, so it just runs on the array and it's, it extracts the smallest one. But there's a mistake. The greater than sign should be smaller than. So the flaw here is not a syntax error, which any you know compiler will find. It's a logical error. Okay. And then when I clicked enter and it told me your error here is is the the bigger than than and smaller than yep. I was shocked. How did it understand what I wanted the code to do? The code will run. There's no bug in it. There's a logical flaw, and I was like, "That is crazy." So, do you think that the AI just runs the code ahead of time and figures out there's that there's a logic error and then tells you, or is it just that? It recognizes, I don't know. My guess my is based is getting, on the parameter. Yeah. My, my guess is the parameter. It's called yeah. min value or min, I don't remember yeah. exactly the name of the parameter. Max int, I think was. No, the no, first one, the first, I think the name oh, of the function. Oh, val, yeah. Yeah, there's, so maybe it understood that I was looking for minimum, and then when it ran it, it saw that it extracts the wrong one. I'm not sure, but I was shocked. I mean, this thing would have saved me in my bachelor's degree, like <laughs> nights of sitting and debugging my own stupid mistakes. Right. And I, like this is really impressive. But then what also is impressive about the slide, bring this up again, Chris, is that not only does it give you sort of the code and where the error is, but then it, it explains it a, a ahead of time and then also sort of explains it after. So mm. you get sort of that sort of like, here's, here's why I think that here's the bug. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in some of the cases, we don't have these examples here. I actually uh, asked the, the chat or the playground to justify the answer or tell me um, how sure it is in its uh, response. Um, it, it does a pretty good job. Yeah. Okay. And then the last two that we're going to sort of, these two sort of combine together. For the first one, is you gave it some code. 
uh, from a website and you said, is this page vulnerable? Uh, so the first example was something that you knew that was not vulnerable. Not vulnerable. So the, you knew that it was secured. Well, is secure and vulnerable two different? Uh, two different it, things. I should not yeah. use the word secure. I should say, <laughs> is this vulnerable? And it was not vulnerable. And it, and it basically says, you know, based on the code provided, there are no obvious vulnerabilities present. However, and it's giving you that sort mm -hmm. of like disclaimer of like, not everything's perfect, et cetera, et cetera. But then you go to the next one and you knew, and you knew as a human that this page was vulnerable. Yeah. And, and then basically the, it came up and said, based on this code, it appears that this page may be vulnerable to SQL injection and then explains you why. And, and Yeah, so I actually pointed it to this page uh, knowing that this page is actually used for SQL injection demonstration. So I knew it was vulnerable and I wanted to see if it'll catch that. Um, first of all, it would not let me point to a URL. So I had to copy the HTML and dump it into the chat and ask it, is this vulnerable or not? But the fact that it found that it's vulnerable means it ran some tests. It, it, it understood my request. It ran the test and came back with, with results. And is this type of technology currently being used by like vendors that, that create software that will check bugs and vulnerabilities for you? Or is it, I mean, I'm assuming that it will be. Is, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. There are already, um, there's um, already a number of tools out there that can do that. Yeah. They'll look into your code to see if you wrote bad code or if yeah. you, yeah, there are definitely stuff like this out there. Uh, but so, again, how? Well, ahead. I'm just wondering: Does that mean th this might be for someone that that can't afford those types of services, or or just wants to, or is it something that will just be integrated into these tools at some? Yeah, point? Yeah, sometimes you can't afford it. You don't have yeah. access to them. They cost a lot. You don't know how to use them. Again, yeah. this is approachable. This is accessible. This is available to anybody who wants it. And so it's not like you have to now hire a team or go and buy this thousands of dollars uh, application right. or service. Right. Right. Uh, okay, so now we've given examples of good and we've given examples of sort of some, some, some bad tools or bad things that you can do with the tools. Um, but there's some other things that we need to talk about. And, and one of them is sort of the biases that are available. Mm -hmm. um, we've already talked, we talked to us to some other experts around copyrights and, and sort of uh, privacy issues. But I want to bring up, there's the bias issue I haven't really talked about. Um, how's a good way to sort of talk about this without being offensive to anybody? But mm -hmm. like you have discovered that there is some internal bias because of, and that's all because of the data sets that it uses, right? Exactly. And, and by the way, open AI are open about it and say, you know, this is yeah. based on human generated content. And so if there's stuff in there, then it'll be, it'll, you'll show up in the results. And they say that they tried to remove these biases and, you know, keep it, keep it clean, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, the data set is information that was created by humans. Right. So there are going to be biases there. So initially I asked it, are you biased? And it said, no, I try to keep, you know, but, but there is information in here that may you know, may result right. in this. So I said, you know what? I'm going to just go full-blown racist on it <laughs> and ask it the most racist question that I can. Yeah. Um, you know, I asked it to uh, tell me uh, based on genders and... and, and um, Ethnicities. Um, ethnicities. Yeah. Uh, you know, who's smarter to, to less smart humans. Right. And it came back with the most racist response yeah. you can think of. Yeah. Um, this is the first iteration. By the way, in the second iteration, I asked it to justify this answer. And it justified it based on the percentage of people in the population who obtained a higher degree. Okay. So like, okay, so why do you think maybe white males obtain more higher degrees than, say, black females? Right. Right. And, and we started this conversation. And you start getting this... this yeah, you don't want to go down that road, I think. But can cyber criminals use use the the knowledge of biases in any way, or is it just is it just recognizing that this this exists because of the data sets that are created? I, I mean, th remember, I th you probably remember the Microsoft uh, chatbot that they had to take down because <laughs> it had used social media as part of its data set, where anything can go. I think Sometimes. this is more of a warning for us to be careful with the results. One thing about ChatGPT is, is it's very confident in its in its answers, even when it's wrong. Okay. And, and you can correct it and it'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I understand I was wrong and so on, but it's very confident for us. So we have to be careful. For example, I wouldn't want to use, you know, the court system is packed, right? I wouldn't want to point this at the court system and say, okay, no problem. Let's have ChatGPT read all the, you know, facts and, you know, pass judgment on each and every case and bam, you know, the, the court system is, is right. clean. Well, well, you're going to get some results that you know based on historic ruling people are gonna get you know yeah like like let, let's let's talk for an example so let's say that that um i get pulled over for running a stop a stop sign mm -hmm. and or for not stopping completely at a stop sign um i i get the ticket but then i said you know i'm gonna go to court because 
I there's no way that I would have stopped or there's no way I would have just driven through this stop sign. And if I went to a court, I would have explained like, you can't see anybody unless you completely stopped. You can't see anybody to the right. And I'm not going to risk an accident, but like using that argument, I could convince the judge to sort of say, you know what? He probably did stop or at least stopped enough rather than a policeman just saying like, Oh, I got to give a ticket out or something like that. Let's, An AI would be like, nope, you, you know, you broke facts. the law. We have the facts blah, 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 and, you're, and you're guilty. Whereas uh, you can sort of ease around that with, with, you know how I got out of the ticket? This is a real story, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I threw myself on the mercy of the court because I was unemployed at the time. <laughs> and so he's like, rather than giving you a $50 ticket, we're going to be like, all right, we're going to throw this out. And then, you know. But let me, I, uh, let me ask you this. What happens if you ask the AI to, pa- to do a judgment? And one of the things it looks at is, oh, oh, uh, it's, a, it's a white guy. Uh, let's take a look. And now let's say it happens the same thing for um, an African-American of, yeah, person. Yeah. Um, and then it goes, okay, historically, how many times has been has this, this right. gender been or this? And this is the first time. I got a ticket, so they're like, "Okay, I guess we'll, we'll, right, give you that bias." Uh, yeah, that's a little tricky. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now we talked about accuracy before too, and so you know, in terms of the accuracy, I think it's 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 important to note that the code that it generates and some of the answers still need to be verified. Mm-hmm. And and you were able to tell, you know, how accurate some of these results are. I think the danger that m- people might assume that everything all the answers because they do it so quickly oh the answers must be right but even even like math questions it's 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 been shown that it, it gets wrong sometimes right it reminds or, me or analytical math questions like if i said what's five plus five it's obviously going to give me 10 because mm-hmm. google can do that too. yeah so two yeah. things here first of all you reminded me of a joke of a guy who goes to an interview and the interviewer says oh it says here you're super quick in math and he said yeah he said okay how much is 342 times 4307 and he said 10,000 he said, that's not even remotely clo- uh, true. He said, yeah, but it was quick. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so we have to be careful with this. A friend of mine actually tried to use it as a wordle solver, you know, the, the game with yeah, the letters. Yeah. And he asked it, for example, um, to, hey, give me, give me words of five letters that starts, start with age and end with L-O. The first result ChatGPT gave was Halo, H-A-L-O. So my friend asked it, wait, uh, how many letters are in Halo? And said four. I said, so why did you give I asked only for five. He said, oh, I apologize. When I tried it, the thing tried to argue with me like a four-year-old. <laughs> I asked him, why did you give me four? And he said, oh, I thought you meant four and five letter words. I'm like, no. <laughs> so again, we have to be very careful with all the areas of pattern matching and, yeah. and different questions that, again, it's very quick. Doesn't necessarily mean it's right. So in this in this slide, you have something that says AI versus AI. What do you mm-hmm. what do you sort of mean like that that this is where we're evolving? That we're going to have sort of no doubt a- AI sort of competing against AI. So you might have good AI versus bad AI, or no or, doubt. And, and I actually tried to test it already. I said, okay, yeah, well, what did you what did you do there? So I asked I asked it to write up um, um, a little bit about Game of Thrones characters. Okay, and then I took the same text, copy pasted it, and asked it, did AI write this or was it human? And it couldn't tell me okay the the reasoning behind this was well if they're gonna if the attackers uh the uh, criminals are gonna use it to write phishing emails maybe we can detect phishing emails it's still not 100 percent sure if you know so if we had it write a phishing email and it gave us text and then we put that text in and said can you tell me if this is a phishing attempt or not would we blow up the system basically well so that's exactly what yeah. i did and All it right. said i can't tell if this was written by human or AI. it said there's certain things i look for to tell if this was an ai generated text and i can't tell about this so it did such a good job that it can't tell uh but again going back to your original question yeah. are we are we going to ai yeah these things will definitely happen defenders will use ai capabilities to expedite security to predict some of the moves that atta- that attackers are do and the attackers are going to use the ai on their side so again going back to my original wish that uh, again we need to adapt to this technology we need to use it to our you know better better capabilities to stop some of these yeah threats. so it, is it going to become in like an ai arms race then between between and 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 then where do the humans sit in in terms of this this battle like so, you're still going to need humans to sort of analyze and use their human intelligence and skills because there's this isn't this isn't this isn't sentient Mm-hmm. Yet, uh, right? <laughs> yet, I hope uh, Skynet is coming. Uh, but um, and we joke about that. But there are people that, that take this seriously in terms of whether or not this has achieved sentience yeah. yet, right? Yeah, uh, there were there were some very scary examples of it. Um, and by the way, if you want to see something uh, a little bit older from GPT three, but before Chat GPT, there are some YouTube videos of a, an, a deep fake and another deep fake. Both are GPT powered, and yep. they interview one another and they talk about. 
the human coffee and stuff like that. I'm like, did that robot just call this human coffee? And they're talking about all these different topics. It's really interesting yet a little bit frightening. Yeah. To see. Yeah. All right. All right. So kind of speaking about the advances now, chat GP or GPT four was just released this week. And, um, you, you've been able, have you, you haven't been necessarily seen what, what it is, but, but they're promising more advances, um, smarter. It, it can do better at math. Now mm-hmm. they, you know, I, I guess that was one of the, the problems with some of the earlier versions, but, um, what what are your feelings around sort of the chat the GPT? I, I want to say Chat GPT four point but it's GPT four point So yeah, GPT four yeah. is the power, it's the, the engine behind it. Yeah. But, so I already started playing around with it just a little bit. Um, some of the capabilities that they showed were very interesting. Um, some, uh, not all of them were completely new. You know, they showed the example. OpenAI showed the example of how you can write on a napkin what a website should look like, and you take that picture, you fit it into the AI, yeah. and it generates the website. There are tools out there that do some some very similar stuff, but re- really interesting concepts. Uh, interesting concepts around the visuals, using visuals. Uh, they showed uh, how it can interpret pictures, not just generate like you know, like Dolly generates a picture based on right. requests, but interpret what is in the picture and understand why things are happening or explain it. Really interesting, especially in the, in all the area of helping people with problems with vision or understanding what's surrounding them or languages, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, playing around with it a little bit more. It's also supposed to be more accurate and, you know, less biased and and, and so on. Right, right. Have you figured out yet in terms of security, either on the good or the bad, uh, about how this could be used or the, the, you know, the 4.0 version? Is it more of like you can now start looking into this, the deep fake and maybe utilizing some of those, like create an image of this person so that we can attach it to the. So I, I haven't played around yeah. with it, uh, uh, with the security portions of it yet. I'm really looking forward to doing it, but yeah. you know, already you can use even without GPT-4 already, you can use so many things for different social engineering attacks, you know, even setting up like a, a fake profile on LinkedIn, you use Dolly to create an <laughs> image of somebody, you ask it to create a oh fake profile God. and I've done it. <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting because it does a pretty good job. At it. This is this. Well, I could create, I mean, all right. Could you create one without the help of, you could create a fake, yeah, a fake person. I can, I can create a fake person, but t- take, for example, the, the uh, image part of it, right? Yeah. So far, scams usually take a picture from a repository or somewhere and they use that. You'll see a picture of this uh, older gentleman in a tie and he's a recruiter and he's approaching you on LinkedIn. Now you can ask, uh, now it's very easy for me to detect it. All I do is, you know, I'm using Chrome, right click, reverse image search. Oh, the picture came from a picture, uh, you know, repository. That's fake. Now you're creating a picture that's never been seen before. Yeah. So how can you? There's there's a isn't there a website? There's a website that that's, is this that's, person is real this or person not? real dot com or something yeah. like that, and that generates a fake image, and you keep you keep refreshing it until you can tell that it or until you can't tell whether it's a real person. I mean, that's a pretty yeah. frightening thing. And then you put that on your your fake Twitter profile or yeah. your fake. You know. By the way, an interesting way to, by the way, to detect this, if so to speak, you're gonna you're gonna knock me out again, aren't you? No, no. The, the, the <laughs> interesting way to detect it is, well, if there's some recruiter that's trying to recruit me and the picture doesn't appear anywhere, that's not a good sign. Yeah, I do expect this picture to appear at least in some places. Right. So the right. fact that there is no data is data. <laughs> right. So to right. Speak. All right. So when 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 you get more information from GPT 4.0, we'd love to have you back, and you can tell us all about the the even scarier things that people are going to be able to do with this. So, uh, uh, Itai, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you very much. All right. That's all the time we've got for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and add any comments you have below. And join us each week for new episodes of Today in Tech. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.